In November of 1882, at uh, an Exeter Hall in London, William Booth called what he, what he called together what he referred to as a war gathering. And during the course of that meeting, he had between 80 and 90 officers standing on the stage whom he commissioned and dispatched and sent out all around the world. Some were appointed in Britain. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> some were appointed to the USA. Yay. Yes. Some went to Canada. Some went to Sweden. Yay. I knew I could count on Eva Kleeman for a hallelujah there. Some went to Sweden. Some went to South Africa. Yay. Yes. We're warming to the task. Some were sent to Australia. And of course, there were some that were sent to New Zealand. Now you might think that was pre-arranged, but I promise you it wasn't. It's just, we're just a fairly enthusiastic bunch down here in the front row, so we're making the most of the opportunity. Amen. He prayed over them, he blessed them, and he sent them out. One of them was a guy by the name of Arthur Barker. He, he was sent out to be the leader of the Salvation Army in the Southern Seas, whatever that means. The Southern Seas. He was sent out. He left the day after his marriage. He was 27 years old. And he was put in charge of the Salvation Army's work in the Southern Seas. Also present at that meeting and standing on the stage were this couple here. Lieutenant Pollard and his dear wife, who was not an officer, but you can tell by the photo, was enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> All 
also on the stage, also on the stage that day was this couple. Edward Wright, his wife, 19. 19 and 20 years of age. They were dispatched from the Exeter Hall in London in November of 1882, and they arrived in New Zealand in April of 1883 and began the work of the Salvation Army. And over the course of that time, they encountered this guy. Whoa, now, now we're talking. This is Staff Sergeant or Sergeant Major Daniel Ranson Buckingham. Oh, hello. <laughs> who was led to the Lord and came to faith and joined the Salvation Army and became the Corps Sergeant Major in a marvellous town of Waimati. <laughs> 300 people and two sheep. Uh, you can't read it from there, but it says, Sergeant Major D.R. Buckingham did 14 days in the Timaru Jail for marching in Waimati, 1885 just after we started in 1883. In the record, the war cry record of my great-great-grandfather, little did he know, right, when he joined up, uh, written in the war cry article is that after he had done his 14 days, he returned to Waimati, and the very first thing he did was marched down exactly the same street, <laughs> held an, an open air in exactly the same spot, and did a further two times in the Timaru jail for about 14 days <laughs> until they got tired of it and gave in, and so established the weekly open-air meeting in the town that we have come from. It's amazing, isn't it, our history, don't you think? 19 and 20 years of age, and they get on a boat, and they travel some 18,000 kilometers to the other side of the world. What motivates somebody to do that? What happens in somebody's life that would cause them to give everything up and say yes to William Booth? Of course, no problem. I'll get on a boat. I'll travel to the other side of the world, and I'll do it enthusiastically and with passion. What causes them to do that? What caused my great-great-grandfather? By the way, don't you like his beard? Did you see that? Can you bring that back up? Look at that. Come on. What do you think, Bronnie? <laughs> I used this photo because he's got a hat on I didn't want to reveal the fact that he's got a beautiful full head of hair <laughs> so, something's happened in the DNA of our outfit it didn't, it didn't pass on down to me but what inspired this guy to give up what he was engaged in which was pretty lucrative to be honest he was doing very well for himself but he sold it all up gave it to the army and threw in his life to the army served for the rest of his days what motivates people to do that? What motivated thousands of people, actually, over the years to make themselves available to God and the army, to go out into the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ? What was the motivation? I want to share with you this afternoon three things, maybe four, that I know motivated them because I've read the journals, I've read the stories, I've read the history, so I understand. And I'm talking about Pollard and Wright, and I'm talking about my great-great-grandfather and others like him whom I have researched. Here are the things that I know to be true about them that resulted in their motivation. First of all, they all testify to a powerful, life-transforming encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. They all testify to an encounter with God that completely changed them. They testify to knowing what it means to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to be embraced, and to experience and understand the true depth of God's love for them as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. They knew what it was to be loved and embraced by God. This was true for them. 
And the result for them was equally important. And that was a natural desire to want to share with other people that which had happened to them and was now true for them because of their encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. So they had had a powerful encounter with God that had changed their lives to the degree that they couldn't help themselves. They just wanted to tell the story. I love that. Beautiful encounter in the Gospels, isn't it, of a woman coming to the well. She has a powerful encounter with Jesus. And immediately following that encounter, the first thing she wanted to do was to go tell people in the village what had happened, about the power of the encounter, about what had happened to her as a result of meeting Jesus. That beautiful biblical account tells us that people from the village came that some believed because of her message and others believed because they'd had an encounter themselves. That's beautiful. That's the DNA of our movement. That's who we are. We're a people that know what it means to be transformed, to come into a beautiful experience of understanding the depth and the breadth of God's love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and adoption and welcome, all because of Jesus. They were people who had been transformed, and they were people who wanted desperately to tell others the good news. It happened for me. I want it to happen for you. That's these guys. That's our heritage. That's our heritage. That's who we are. Second thing that I've discovered in my read of these people, and many others like them, is that they had a genuine concern and care for other people. They had a genuine care and concern for other people. Not just concerned about their own welfare or their own circumstances or their own stuff. They possessed a genuine caring concern for other people, for vulnerable people, for lost people, for hurting people, for disadvantaged people. Any people. All people. They demonstrated it, not just in the things they said, but they demonstrated it by the things that they did. Soup kitchens, homeless shelters, etc., etc., etc. They understood what the founder meant when he said, you just cannot go for the soul when the belly's empty. Right? They understood. So they had this desire within their hearts not just to talk out the gospel, but to demonstrate the values of the gospel in the way in which they engaged with each other and others. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Right? That's the Salvation Army. That's the DNA of this movement. That's our heritage. There was another thing that I found and found to be very interesting as I did this journey, Uh, it's true of these folks that I've put their pictures up on the wall, but it's also true of thousands of others in our past. There was this deep longing and desire to glorify God with their living. I, I love that. A genuine desire to glorify God with their living. That somehow the very living of their lives would be Salt would be light, would, ha- would somehow be the aroma of Christ in the world. And so I see through the reading of their journals that they were ruthless with themselves. Let no sin abound in me. Let no false pretense abound in me. Let no pride abound in me. <laughs> Lord, let me be full of this, your Holy Spirit. Let me be empowered by your spirit to live a life that is clean and free and pure and attractive that I might glorify you and be used by you to extend your kingdom. Three quite simple yet deeply profound strategies to know him, to make him known. 
to care for others and then to live my life in such a way that I might bring glory and honor to him, the pursuit of the holy life. This, in my view, is a description of salvationists. When somebody says, what's a salvationist? In my view, anyway, in my humble opinion, standing here with my big corify on, and <laughs> my, I've never had so many medals in all my life. Look at that. It's impressive. You're jealous, I can tell. <laughs> You're not getting one. <laughs> in my simple and humble opinion, friends, I think this, is, this has been something of the... Of the the blessing of the movement over the years is some clarity about this stuff, about this understanding of who we are as a people of God, what, what we're about, why we're doing the things that we're doing. We have to go back there to sort of get a sense of what it was that drove a 19 and 20 year old to get on a boat and go to the other side of the world. We have to capture some of that within our own hearts so that the Lord might use us in this generation. <laughs> ah, deep, meaningful connection with God, our Creator, through faith in Jesus Christ. We can't wait to tell people about the hope that is in us. I love the fact, and I rejoice in the fact, that there are people like this all over the world today. Amen. There are men and women, officers, soldiers, staff, volunteers, men and women and young people all over the world today who are captured by these three great ideas. There are. And I celebrate it in our movement. We often speak about the challenges we face, but let's this afternoon take an opportunity to celebrate the things that are good. There are men and women all around the world motivated by a desire to worship the Lord and give a reason for the hope that is in them. There are men and women who get up every morning under the umbrella of the Salvation Army, possessed of a desire to care for other people, to make a difference. And there are men and women within our movement who get up every morning with a desire that the Holy Spirit should have all of them, and that somehow their living in this simple day might bring glory and honor to Him, the pursuit of the holy life. I'm captured by this, you know. People have been asking me, what's your vision? You know, what's the strategy? What's the... Ooh, I've been waiting for the Lord to give me. I've been waiting for the Lord to kind of bounce something on me that I can say, oh, it's this, 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 and this, you know. Uh, oh, man, it's like I'm running out of time. The welcome meeting's on the third. <laughs> I need save souls, grow saints, serve suffering. I need, I, need, I need one of those handles. Hasn't come hasn't come. But what has come is the Spirit guiding me to this truth about us, that some of our usefulness and some of our success to the Master moving into the future is contained within a good understanding of our past and what really motivated our men and women to do what they did. It wasn't the metaphor. It wasn't. It wasn't the metaphor. It wasn't the tambourines and the uniforms. And I'm not saying anything bad about any of that stuff. This metaphor and this motif has served us and is serving us well. But that's not what drove them. What drove them was Jesus. What drove them was the transformation of their own life, their own liberation, their own birth into the kingdom of God. That's what drove them. What drove them is that they had been captured by the love of God. Not deserving it, he still reached his arms around to embrace them. And they were captured by a desire that anyone and everyone on the planet had, to, had the right to know that God loved them yeah. and that Jesus was the proof. Yeah. That drove them. That captured them. They were driven by a desire to practice the values of the kingdom of God, to care for others, to love others to look for opportunities to reach others and to, and to glorify God with the living of their lives. 
Do you know that there are people who are saying of the Salvation Army that our light is dimming, that the fire is waning, (laughs) that the energy is diminishing. Paul, when he was writing to the Romans, he said, keep your spiritual fervor, keep your zeal and your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. This suggests the possibility that it can diminish, that you can lose it, that you can lose your fervor, that you can lose your spiritual zeal, that you can lose your passion, that it can, if you'll pardon the expression, it can leak. There are some suggesting that it's leaking in our movement that we're losing our passion, that we're losing our zeal, that we're losing our sense of mission in the world to preach the gospel, to care for the needy, to transform society, to make a difference, to be the aroma of Christ in the world, that we're losing... Are we? No way, man. No way. (laughs) Hmm. It's interesting, you know, uh, there's a beautiful passage of Scripture in the book of Revelations. There's these letters to the churches, writing to Ephesus. The writer says, you're good in so many ways. You're great in so many ways. You're doing this and you're doing that, and you're getting into this and you're getting into that. It's a beautiful thing, but this is the observation I would make. This is the criticism that I would offer. You've lost your first love. You've lost your first love. And there's this appeal that they would return to their first love. And then, of course, theologians and commentators, they've got a hold of it, and everybody's trying to describe and to understand what the first love is. Some say it's their love for God. Some say it's their love for each other. Some say it's their love for others. Whatever it is, they've lost it. And they're being called back to their first love. Could it be that maybe in these days, maybe in these days, Our strategy lies in our acknowledgement that the Spirit of God is calling us, maybe, as a movement, back to those first things. Now, that does not mean that we can't be creative or energetic or imaginative. It doesn't mean that we can't look for new strategies and new ways. But it does mean that we understand why we exist and what we're about as a community of God's people. We want that people would understand and know personally what it is to be loved by God through faith in Jesus Christ, to have that life-transforming experience of being forgiven, released, and adopted into the family of God. We want people to know that story. We want to find ways to tell that story. No excuses. We want to find opportunities to tell the story. God's redeeming grace through Jesus Christ. I would love to hear a few more amens. That's who we are. That's who we are, people. I'd love us, Lord, please help us to recapture and re-understand that our caring ministries, that our reaching out to people is a demonstration of love, is from the overflow of the love we've experienced ourselves, that we're reaching out to the least, the lost, and the low. We're doing it with intent, with design, with purpose. We want people to know that God loves them. We're not going to tell them only. We're going to demonstrate it. Why are you doing this for me? God's love compels me. God love compels me. And we want people to ask the question, what is it, Dean, that's so different about you? Right? We want people to ask the question because they're sensing something when they encounter us. They're sensing something different, something real, something powerful. What is that? That's the presence of the Spirit of God inside a surrendered heart. That's what it is. The presence of the Holy Spirit inside a surrendered heart. Revive us, Lord. Come on. Revive us, Lord. Help us to recapture that for which you raised us up. Help us to be brave enough, to be creative and innovative, to take risks, to try that men and women might know through spoken word, through act, and through personal witness, what it means to be in the family of God.
revive us, O oh Lord. Now, one of the things that I've been discovering uh, in my term of service at international headquarters is that actually with the more fancy titles, you appear to be able to accomplish less and less. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? You get the title. You know, Whoa, I've got the office. How come I can't get anything done? <laughs> this is a very humbling experience to realize that actually you are powerless to affect much change on your own. Doesn't matter what your rank is. Doesn't matter what the portfolio is. Doesn't really matter how fancy the Korowai is or how big the medals are. On your own, ah, you're powerless. You can make suggestions. You can write papers. You can send notes. But oof, my goodness. So I can say, dear Lord, let's get this army pumping. Let's get on fire. Let's get intentional. Let's get excited. Let's believe for the future. I can write papers about that. I can write in the officer magazine. I can put little videos on um, Facebook and all those Twittery things and whatnot. Um, I haven't even worked out how to use it. There's somebody posting on behalf of me now. I don't even know. that. I just, it just appears. It's wonderful. Ah, I can't do it. Here's what I can do. Here's what I can do. I can put myself in the presence of the king... And I can say, count on me. I can say, I'm all in. I'm sold for this. You want me to experience you at a deeper level, I'm all in. You want me to find ways to share the story of God's love in Jesus, I'm all in. You create the opportunities, I will find the voice. I can do that, right? I can go before the master and say to him, give me the energy, the insight, the spiritual awareness to see where I can meet a need, where I can make a difference for somebody else, where I can care, where I can demonstrate the values of the kingdom in simple acts of kindness and love. I don't need a specialized program. I don't need a government grant. I can just do it tomorrow. Right? And so can you. And so can you. And so can you. And I can kneel before the master, and I can say to the master, sincerely and honestly and truthfully, my desire is that in some way the living of my life would bring glory to you. Not to me, but to you. So cleanse me, rebuke me, chastise me, teach me, discipline me, fill me with your spirit, and help me to live as a free man Hallelujah. as you intended me to be. Full of the spirit, full of joy, full of peace, full of confidence, not in myself, but in the God of my salvation. Hallelujah. And if he can do it for me, and he will, he can do it for you. He can do it for us. He can do it for our movement all around the globe. And increasingly, in days of difficulty and challenge, days of jealousy and pride and hatred and greed, where those who are already being tormented become tormented even more, this surely is a time for the body of Christ to rise up. Not, not to be fighting with each other, but to be agreed that this is what we exist for and let's get on with it. Yeah. For the glory of God, for the salvation of the lost, for the establishment of his kingdom. To this, to this, I am absolutely 100% committed. Amen. How about you? Amen. How about you? Don't underestimate how the king above will use, will use for the extension of his kingdom, a surrendered life who has a desire to tell the good news of the gospel and to genuinely love and care for others. You can change the world. We can change the world. Let's get on with the business. Send us a
Thank you.